So welcome everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining us this afternoon for the Digging In with Teaching with Primary Sources MTSU webinar series. Um, this is our first uh, Digging In session um, for 2021. Um, so again, thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, this month, of course, we are focusing on uh, ideas uh, and ways to approach teaching Black History Month. And so we'll be sharing with you different things um, that we have come across that we thought were really interesting and really uh, kind of uh, helped us as we were thinking about new ways to approach teaching African American history um, and, and just uh, thinking about how we approach Black History Month. So before we jump into that topic, uh, a couple things. Uh, just remember, if you would, to please keep your mics muted throughout. Um, as I mentioned, we are recording this for inclusion on our YouTube channel, um, so that just helps us to have a clean audio. Um, if you would, find your name in the participant list uh, and rename yourself uh, with your first and last name. We appreciate that. It just helps us to kind of monitor uh, and record who is participating live. Uh, and then I also know, of course, who we're talking to as we're chatting in the chat box. Uh, we do want the session to be interactive, um, so if you would, uh, again, use that chat box. Uh, you also have reaction buttons that you can use, and we will be doing some polling and have some polling questions uh, for those participating with us live. If you happen to be watching the recording later on, uh, unfortunately, the polling questions don't show up, but we will read those questions and the answer choices so that you are aware of what they are. As with this entire series, we do have a Padlet available where you can find all of the resources shared for any of the webinars in this series um, that we have been doing um, since summer last year. So there's been quite a few now. Um, and again, you can find that either at this web address or using this QR code. Um, and I'll remind you of this again at the end. And we'll be adding some things um, to the Padlet for today's session um, after the fact. Um, so right now there's just uh, our newsletter up, but we'll be putting some other things up there um, for those of you um, to look at um, after the fact. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to my colleague, Stacey Graham, uh, to talk to us a little bit about the theme for this month. Thanks, Kira. I am gonna share my screen so that you can all see the newsletter. Uh, and then I'm going to make it I'm going to make it a little bit larger because I know that people usually request that uh, when I'm showing this to them. So uh, if you haven't seen this yet, uh, this is our newsletter for February. And it's been a while since we have done a newsletter that corresponds with what that particular month is commemorative for, but we have done this in previous years. But we had decided we don't wanna just do another African-American history issue, we wanted it to be more about the teaching of African American history in the classroom in a new era of um, having to be aware as educators about what this means for our country and for our classrooms. And so we wanted to kind of make it different. And so that made us want to have a bit more of a conversational tone and share with you some of our insights uh, that we have gotten from uh, just lots of the different stuff that we have learned because we're on this journey with you and we're constantly learning these things as people and as educators and as scholars. Um, but I did wanna highlight right away our awesome source of the month. Uh, Kira found this one. It's uh, a really great example of how there are some posters uh, within the past 50 years on the Library of Congress website that are public domain. Most of them are protected by copyright, and so you can't get a larger JPEG to use. But this one with Shirley Chisholm is not. And so you can use it uh, and cite it from the Library of Congress from this link. She's such a fascinating person in American politics. She's a person I'd always heard of, but I didn't really know about, and I certainly wasn't taught about her. Um, but I have seen her come up more and more often in my Facebook feed of late, uh, just from other things that I follow. So I encourage you to check her out uh, with your students. So here is our uh, page long kind of conversational article um, uh, where Kira and Layla and October uh, specifically share some of the resources that they have been exploring and enjoying and getting a lot out of uh, over the past year. And I would have done a paragraph too, but we, we just would have spent the whole newsletter doing that. So we had to, to cut it off somewhere. Um, 
But uh, so we have two lesson ideas, uh, a highlighting local voices and stories one that focuses on the Clinton 12 from Anderson County in East Tennessee. And then one about teaching about black abolitionists, which is gonna be our feature. So October is gonna talk more about that later. And then we're gonna come back and look at a couple of these resources too, when we kind of take that time after the feature. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna turn it over to October to tell us more about all these black abolitionists that we didn't learn about. Yeah, let me share my screen. All right, so I'm gonna be talking to you guys today about my featured lesson idea, which is teaching black abolitionists. And so just for a quick pointer, the importance of teaching about black abolitionists. So I think a lot of teachers teach it on the very um, basic level. I know Tennessee standards have you at least look at um, very popular abolitionists like Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass. Um, and sometimes I think students get confused when they only learn about two or three people in the black abolition movement about how widely spread abolition was for free and newly freed Blacks um, pre-Civil War. And so it helps give students more perspective on what Black life was like pre-Civil War. And it teaches students about Black agency and perseverance as they learn more about the efforts of free Blacks to abolish slavery and to protect their own rights to remain free. There are a lot of laws being passed trying to um, punish free um, Black people from helping um, enslaved people escape and sometimes that infringed on their own rights to be free and they had to protect that. And then they, it also highlights an often overlooked group in history, which is free Blacks before emancipation. Um, not a lot of students learn about Black life pre-Civil War besides learning about what enslaved people went through, which is important, but there was a really big culture of free Blacks before emancipation. Um, race still affected their life even though they were free, so they were very segregated from um, white people in America, and therefore they had their own cultures, their own groups, um, their own politics, their own education systems. They had an entire uh, way of life that's not really talked about in K through 12 education. So teaching about the Black abolition movement helps give students more perspective on what that culture looked like before emancipation and the Civil War. So one of the um, abolitionists I wanted to highlight was Mary Ann Shad Carey. And I think we have a poll about who knows about Mary Ann Shad Carey. So we're going to do that poll. So if you would just take the time to have you ever heard about Mary Ann Shad Carey, if you teach her or if you don't teach her. Looks like we've got just about everybody responded. We'll give just another second in case someone hasn't had a chance and we will. All right, so a majority of you guys have not. Uh, we have one yes, but they don't teach her and um, eight no's. So that's perfectly fine. I had no idea about her until I went to go create this resource, but she's a really awesome woman. So I wanted to share her. So Mary Ann Shad Carey was a writer, teacher, lawyer, abolitionist, and women's rights activist. She was born free in Delaware, um, but raised by parents who were very heavy abolitionists. They were conductors in the Underground Railroad. Um, they moved their two daughters from Delaware to Pennsylvania so that they could get an education because in Delaware, it was illegal to educate free Black children. So they moved to Pennsylvania and she got a Quaker education there. When she finished school, she started teaching. Um, she, she started teaching in black schools in Delaware, Pennsylvania, and New York, and she was very heavy in writing about the freedom of enslaved people. Um, and then after, and and a part of the underground underground railroad. And then after Congress passed the Fugitive Slave Act, she immigrated to Canada because the Fugitive Slave Act was imposing very harsh penalties on anyone who was helping free the enslaved. Um, while in Canada, she started a newspaper called the, 
the Provincial Freeman, and it was the first newspaper in Canada that was an anti-slavery newspaper. And she became the first newspaper woman in North America. So the first woman to start a newspaper in North America. After the breakout of the Civil War, she returned to the United States from Canada to help with recruitment. And she went to Washington, DC, and she studied law at Har Howard University. For some unknown reason, it took her 16 years to get her law degree, but she did eventually persevere and get her law degree. And she was one of four women in her class and the only black woman to receive her Bachelor of Law degree in 1883. And until her death, she continued to fight for black women and women's rights. Um, and she was a very big uh, speaker. She became a traveling speaker in a lot of women's rights activist circles. And then I also wanted to show you. Can you guys see this new screen? Yes, okay. So I also wanted to show you that Mary Ann Shedd Carey was entered into the National Women's Hall of Fame. She was honored in 1998. So this is her on the Women's Hall of Fame website. And her house was also preserved by the National Park Service. So her house is something that you can see that's been preserved and they have a marker for her there in Washington DC, which is really great because this is the house where she fought for her law degree received her law degree where she practiced law and she eventually died of stomach cancer in Washington, DC. So this is the house where she died and she's buried in DC. So this house is very important to her life and legacy and it is preserved by the National Park Service. The next person that I wanted to feature for y'all is David Ruggles. So we have another poll about if anyone has heard about the abolitionist David Ruggles. Okay, so all knows, oh no. Again, I didn't know about him either, but I think he's a great guy, so we're going to talk about him. So David Ruggles was an abolitionist writer, publisher, and business owner. He was born free in Connecticut, and again, was educated at a religious charity, um, a Quaker school that was common for free black children. And after he finished school, he relocated to New York and he opened a grocery store and he used his grocery store to hire self-emancipated black people. And he also started a library and reading room in his grocery store for black people since it was illegal for them to use New York public libraries. Um, so he's largely considered the first black owned bookstore in the United States. And due to the work that he did, he was highly targeted by pro-slavery mobs. So his grocery store and library were burned down three separate times and each time he rebuilt it. And he was sent to jail twice um, for helping free people because free in the enslaved, he was a conductor on the Underground Railroad. And twice that he was brought into jail, he was um, savagely beaten by mobs who would show up at his jail cell and the police would usually turn a blind eye um, and he, again, was a very well-known conductor of the Underground Railroad, and Frederick Douglass is one of the people that he helped escape into the North, and so Frederick Douglass writes multiple times about how he owes his life to David Ruggles. And I also wanted to show you guys a couple of the things on Ruggles. So when teaching this to your class, do encourage them to go outside of the links that I created for y'all on the student packet, which I'll show you guys at the end. Um, but one of the things that you can have your students do when they're researching these Black abolitionists is to have them go to Chronicling America, since sometimes these Black abolitionists show up in our um, American newspapers. So I just entered David Ruggles' name and then specified the time period that he lived, and I was able to find a couple of newspapers that talked about him. This one is about one of his arrests um, and it's information about how he was arrested for helping a slave named Tom escape from his owner. So his owner found out that David Ruggles was the one that helped him escape and had him arrested and put on bail and tried. He was eventually 
um, released from his trial because they didn't have enough evidence that he helped his slave escape. It was just a lot of hearsay, but this was something that they put into the paper about his arrest. There's also another paper about him being kicked off of a railroad um, or off of a train car. He was traveling in a train and he sat among white passengers and he was informed by a train agent that he couldn't sit there. He refused to move and then was forcibly moved. Um, and someone put it in the paper highlighting this um, event and was praising the railroad company for standing up for their beliefs in segregation because um, Ruckles was so <laughs> despised by people, uh, by white people in New York. Um, so this was someone, you know, I guess, <laughs> praising the railroad company for standing up to Ruggles because he was a well-known name in white and black circles in New York. And then this is a telegraph from Vermont about the enslaved uh, that some of the enslaved that David Ruggles helped escape. Um, they're praising David Ruggles for helping seven slaves escape in, on, using the Underground Railroad. Um, so this was published in the paper talking, um, giving um, all praises to David Ruggles for helping them and then asking people to pray for the slaves who were escaping because their journey wasn't over. So asking them to pray for um, safe escape for those slaves for the rest of their journey. So you have two very competing um, notions. You have some people in the community who is despising David Ruggles and doesn't want to see him accomplish things. And then you have this um, telegraph that shows that there are people who supported him, supported the Underground Railroad and the things that he was doing. And those are two different perspectives that your students can get on this abolitionist. Um, so that's all I wanted to show you on David Ruggles. But I also just wanted to show you how to get to the resource that we created for you on teaching Black abolition. So if you go to our website right there, this is just the Library of Congress, or not Library of Congress, the MTSU Library website. You just go to library.mtsu.edu slash TPS. And then here on the side, you'll see a bunch of tabs and you can click on the one that says newsletters. And then of course you can find the February newsletter here. And if you scroll down to the lesson idea on Black abolitionists, the student packet is listed for you right there. So David Ruckles and Mary Shan Todd Carey are in this, um, student packet for y'all, but there's also a couple that we didn't talk about today that you can check out and have your students do deeper research on. Um, you can split your students into five groups because we listed five abolitionists in this student packet for you and have them create a project together. Um, since some of you guys are teaching virtually, that could be like a virtual poster or a PowerPoint, or if your students want to get really fancy and create their own website on their abolitionist, they can do that and then present it to the class about what their abolitionist did, their life, their legacy, and the impact they had on the abolition movement and um, Black life in their area. Or you can have your students find their own abolitionists. I did link to a website that has a lot of different profiles about different Black abolitionists that we didn't mention in our student packet. So they can pick their own person and do their own individual research and create a project about that person to share with their class. And that could be your lesson idea for having your students learn about Black abolitionists. And then the other one thing that I did want to show you is this really cool exhibit from the Library of Congress. So they have an African American mosaic exhibit. Um, and one of the sections of their exhibit is on abolition. It doesn't specifically talk about um, different Black abolitionists, but it can help your students have a timeline for what the abolition movement um, looked like. So how it started, um, very important. Um, events that happened during the abolition movement, important publications and newspapers, anti-slavery um, newspapers that came out during that time. They also have highlights of anti-slavery and anti-colonization songs. So music was a big part of the abolition movement and they have um, some primary resources for music sheets um, so your students can analyze the songs from that time period. Um, and I just thought this would be a really good background information for your students so that they're not just going in blind about the larger movement besides just the abolitionists they may be concentrating on. So that's also linked for you in the PowerPoint there. 
And I'm going to turn it over to Kira so she can start talking about teaching Black history. Yeah, thank you, October, uh, for sharing those because I was not familiar with several of those names. Um, so I think we've got. Uh, Oh, yeah. Um, so as she's pulling up our the correct version of that PowerPoint there. Um, so it's interesting, you know, we're thinking about, um, you know, ways that we can engage our students. Uh, I think it's interesting to think about bringing in new names, new people, because um, I think a lot of times we kind of get stuck in a rut of like the same like three or four people who show up in our curriculum. And so students hear about those folks, um, you know, in, in elementary school and middle school and high school. And so thinking about that there are more people involved, there are richer stories and there are still stories that we can continue to discover and share with our students. And that's definitely a great way to think about bringing in October's lesson idea there on black abolitionist. Um, so when we were thinking about how we wanted to approach um, the newsletter for this month, uh, we got to thinking about a lot of the different, uh, you know, PD sessions and, and different resources that we have run across, uh, you know, just over the last year. Um, and it's really amazing um, some of the conversations that we, uh, you know, have listened to online and, you know, and again, things that are being shared. And so we wanted to kind of take some of the things that, that we've learned um, and share those with you. And so that was really kind of the inspiration for how we put together this month's feature. Um, so if you go to the next slide for me, October. So one thing that I run across that really stood out to me, um, I was, uh, I did the National Council for Social Studies Conference, virtual conference this year. And one of the sessions that I listened to, um, and I can't, what says, I can't even remember the lady's name that was the presenter, but I, I wrote down this question that she said, and it just really um, kind of got to me, uh, was thinking about how we can center different voices in our curriculum. Uh, and so she had this question uh, where she was saying, you know, when she was putting together her curriculum each year uh, and thinking about, you know, in, any lesson really that she was doing, um, she asked herself the question, you know, how are African Americans experiencing and influencing this period of time? And so that, you know, if she was asking that question, that then she was able to really teach through different types of people, uh, instead of just kind of teaching about them, but, you know, really thinking about how uh, active, uh, you know, essentially how people experience life, right? You know, right now, um, everything that happens, we're all experiencing, we're all being influenced by it, um, and so really kind of centering those human stories in the middle of her curriculum and using that as a way for her students um, to be able to see themselves in the curriculum and to connect to the curriculum by seeing people who looked like them. Um, and you really, you could take that question and you could really turn it and talk about really any specific group of people uh, or any age group or gender or whatever. Like, again, you know, our history is about people. Uh, and how people have experienced, uh, you know, life. Um, so if you go back to the previous screen for me, October. So, you know, it's really taking that question and, you know, centering different voices in our curriculum. Uh, and so that we can have our students, um, again, think about um, how, uh, you know, how different people are experiencing and what kind of influence they have over events. And so the thing we go uh, into, you know, again, thinking about this quote that I have here from uh, Dr. LeGarrette King, where we're teaching uh, about black people and not, uh, that we often too often teach about black people and not through black people. Um, and so I, that was just something that really made me stop and think again, it's such a simple question, but it really has the potential to really change how we approach and teach. Um, and it also a way to engage our students um, in a different way than we currently do. Because um, again, you know, we wanna make sure that our students are seeing themselves and see how you know, their ancestors um, experienced life uh, and had influence over what was happening. And this is a definitely a way to think about uh, bringing that in. Um, if you're not familiar with Dr. LeGarrette King, um, he is actually over at uh, the University of Missouri and teaches at uh, the Carter Center um, over there. And so he's got a lot of great resources. And I know that October is going to talk a little bit more about him. Um, but we listened to a presentation that he gave at uh, an equity summit for the National Council for History Education um, this summer. 
And again, some of the things that he was sharing there I thought were just really very, very interesting uh, in different ways to approach teaching Black history. And they have a lot of great resources. So I would definitely uh, recommend um, checking out um, his work and the work that they're doing there at the Carter Center um, at the University of Missouri as another resource. So I think our next share of uh, resources is going to be Layla. Yep, it's me. Hi, guys. Uh, thank you for joining us. So I'm going to just be sharing a few resources as well with you all. And the first thing I wanted to share is an article that I actually wrote about in our TPS February newsletter. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you guys. All right. So this article is called The Courage to Teach Hard History. And it is a great article for teachers, a great article for people who aren't teachers, a great article to piece together with your students. And this is by Dr. Jeffries. Um, Dr. Jeffries is fantastic. Um, I think he's at Ohio State University. Um, so he wrote this article with teaching tolerance. Now they're learning for justice. We're gonna get into that name shift in a moment too. Uh, but this article really just kind of digs into why teachers have a responsibility to teach hard history, like the institution of enslavement and how our country has been built in certain cities, certain places because of enslavement um, and because of these hard histories. Um, so this article really talks about how it's a teacher's responsibility to not shy away from these hard histories, to not just check off your standard because you feel uncomfortable um, talking about it or it makes your students uncomfortable because hard history, difficult histories are going to make us uncomfortable. Um, so this article, like I said, he goes into slavery is hard, genocide is hard history, but we have to talk about why these histories are important to where we are today, why they're relevant. Um, we're uncomfortable with the implications that these topics raise um, about the past and the present, but we have to teach them accurately to our students. So like I said, this article is probably geared towards teachers, but I do think it's really important to share, like little pieces that you could share with your students like this part right here. Some say that slavery was our country's original sin, but it's much more than that. Slavery is our country's origin. I think that's a really powerful statement and you could piece, take pieces from this article and share them with your middle school or high school students and ask them to you know, address this part of this, um, this article. What do you think? You know, how, how does this relate to our history today? So I really do think there are pieces in this article while it's geared towards teachers that could really benefit students in their learning process as well. Um, there's a little piece at the end I wanted to share with you guys as well. It says America's founders were visionaries but their vision was severely limited. So another piece that you could share with your students and ask them, you know, like, let's digest this statement for a minute, sit with it, and then let's unpack it. Right? So there are a lot of pieces in here that I think you could jigsaw out with your students or you know, just talk about it with them. So that's one of the pieces that's highlighted in our February newsletter. I also wanted to share that um, teaching, uh, teaching Tolerance now has a new name, Learning for Justice. So um, this is their homepage here. So if you're looking for Teaching, for, uh, teaching Tolerance resources, uh, they're now Learning for Justice. And there is a little blurb at the bottom of their homepage about why they changed their name. So if you're interested in that name change, that article is at the bottom of the now learningforjustice.org homepage. And one more thing I wanted to share with you guys from Learning for Justice um, are their podcasts. These are amazing. These are great teacher resources. You could also assign a few minutes to listen for your students. Um, so they have Teaching Hard History, which is actually Dr. Jeffries hosts this um, podcast here. They also have other podcasts, um, all different topics that are relevant to students and relevant to our content that we're teaching. And these are all available on Spotify. I found them recently. So you can listen to these on Spotify for free. Okay, the other thing I wanted to share with you guys, can everybody still see my screen? Okay, cool. I know everybody is probably aware, with this, uh, aware of the Southern Poverty Law Center. This is a great resource to use as well. And I'm specifically showing you guys the hate map. So this hate map is something that I think is super relevant to our students' lives. I got asked a lot when I taught, why are we learning about this history? Why is it relevant to my life? You can show students this map and explain that hate groups aren't just 
pre-American Civil War or during Reconstruction or during Jim Crow, there are so many hate groups still in the United States. And this hate map tracks that. And what I also like about this map is that you can click on a state and it'll tell you what hate groups are here. So you can kind of go into those different groups and talk about why these things are relevant. And so you could see there are neo-confederacy groups. Um, there also, you can, let me change that filter. You can also filter by, by group. So you can like say, filter map by this ideology. So you can see all the places that have these different hate groups. And one thing that I think is interesting, you can make this work for your content level because we have anti-immigration links here. So if you're te teaching about the Chinese Exclusion Act or different pieces on immigration, you can show the relevancy to life today using this hate map. Um, so that's one way, an interactive way to really show students the relevancy um, from the past to what, what's happening today. So that's the hate map from the Southern Poverty Law Center. And the last thing I wanted to show you guys, this is a really cool site. I had never heard about it until this year, never knew anything about it. Um, so it's the site is africanamericanhistorymonth.gov. It's also linked in our February newsletter. So this is a great site that's come um, been pieced together by different partners. Look at all these partners here. So Library of Congress, um, the Smithsonian National Archives, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, State Parks, and the National Endowment for Humanities. So we have all of these different um, institutions coming together to create this website. They also have lectures linked here, book talks. So if you have something that you're interested in, you can look on this website and find it, I'm sure. But I wanna share with you guys the four teachers tab. This tab is really interesting. It's actually laid out, um, if you're familiar with teaching with primary sources, it's actually kind of laid out like our primary source sets. I like that. Um, so they have resources here from the Library of Congress and they lay them out by institution. What's here? And I really like that this website is so organized because if you're looking for something specific, if you're looking for something from an institution, you can pull from there. So a few things that I wanted to share with you guys from this site, I absolutely love these um, docs teach from the National Archives. So I'm gonna show you guys three different pieces they have here. One's for elementary, one's for middle, and one's for high school. This one is called uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Fight for Civil Rights. So you can just click on this. It's interactive for students. So if you're doing this online, you can do it virtually. And has some questions here looking at a photo. Who is this person? What do you think he's doing? That kind of thing. And then, move my little Zoom participant screen. There we go. You can scroll down and oh, my little bar's in the way. Hold on. There we go. Let me just go this way for you. You can scroll down. Sorry, I couldn't see my whole screen there and switch view. And then it shows you the bigger image. And you can kind of digest the entire picture rather than just that small piece. So what's actually happening here? What are these people doing? So that's an elementary idea. And you can discuss, list the people you see, who are they, what's this photo doing, what do they want, that kind of thing. And it focuses on zooming and cropping and looking at the small picture, then looking at the big picture. Another one that I really enjoy is this Civil War comparing re recruitment posters. I think this is super helpful. Um, you have two recruitment posters. One is geared towards freedmen. One seems to be more geared towards enslavers. So you can look at these posters and kind of discuss how are they different? Who created these posters and why the intended audience? And this is more of a middle school lesson. And the last thing I wanted to share with you guys is this one about Dred Scott um, to the Civil Rights Act. So a huge time period. Um, and you had, this is high school. All of these different pieces, you're comparing these different documents. So a photograph, um, the 13th Amendment, Emancipation Proclamation, all the way up to, um, I think the Civil Rights Act, yeah. So you're comparing these documents. What do they have in common? How do they re relate to Black history? How do they relate to voting rights? And students have to type in their response. And then once they do that, there's a little piece where they can email their response directly to you. So you don't have to worry about downloading all these responses later. They go straight to your email. So again, these are all available on the African American uh, History Month 
youth.gov website. All right. And I think that's everything that I have. I'm going to turn it back over to October now. Thanks, Layla. Those are really cool. I need to check that website out. I love that. I'm going to share my screen with you guys again. And um, like Kira was talking about earlier, I just wanted to describe uh, Dr. LeGarrett King's six principles for teaching holistic Black history. We learned this um, in our civil rights fellowship that the TPS team is holding with some other schools across the, um, the South and teaching about Black history um, and ways to teach a long arc of civil rights. And so Dr. LeGarrett King was nice enough to come and talk to us during one of our webinars and he talked about these six principles that I think have really impacted the way that I see um, Black history in K-12 education, so I wanted to share them with y'all. So his first one is teaching Black joy and Black love. So a lot of the times we focus on um, Black oppression, which is important to teach and obviously number three, so it's not something that we should gloss over, but we should also teach about um, Black joy and Black love. His recommendations are through music. Um, that's one way to teach about Black joy and Black love so that um, students get a more holistic view about Black identity, which is the second one. So teaching more about Black women um, and just identities within the Black community that have diversity. So um, people, uh, Black women leaders, which we don't learn about a lot. Sometimes the way we teach civil rights is very focused on Black men and their contributions. Um, sometimes we don't understand the different, um, this, Sometimes we don't look at the different intersections of different religions. So a lot of the time, especially when we're teaching civil rights, we're looking at black men in the Protestant Christian church. So how do we teach about black people who have different religious backgrounds um, and just different diverse identities than what we normally see in our K through 12 textbooks around civil rights. Um, the third one is teaching about systemic power, oppression, and racism. So besides the institution of slavery, sometimes students don't get a good idea about what systemic oppression looks like. Uh, we teach a lot of individual um, and micro level oppressions, um, which are important, but you want to teach about how, like Layla was saying, these um, systemic powers are still around today. So um, we did war on drugs. We did an entire lesson plan on war on drugs last year that would show about systemic power and oppression towards African-American communities. Um, and you can also teach about housing discrimination is one idea, um, which we should do a lesson plan on now that I'm thinking about it. Um, but just other ways of showing systemic and oppression past racism and past Jim Crow and how this still affects African Americans today. Um, the fourth one is teaching agency, resistance and perseverance. Um, so like the lesson plan we just shared on black abolitionists, how do um, um, African Americans still persist through the oppression that they're facing um, and in different ways besides just teaching about the civil rights movement. Um, so, you know, there's the Black Panthers that are not commonly talked about and Black power movements that are a different way of showing agency and resistance to oppression that can be talked about in schools more often. Then the fifth one was teach Africa and the diaspora. So a lot of the times we start off teaching black history, just focusing on slavery. Um, and we don't talk about where the enslaved came from, um, the cultures of ancient Africa and Africa today and how that affects the diaspora that they come from, um, how that affected how they practice religion during like how the enslaved impacted religion. A lot of that has to do with African cultures that came with them. So their culture didn't just disappear when they landed here. So then how do we teach about that culture in Africa and how that affects the diaspora that we see today in America? Um, and then the sixth one is teaching Black historical consciousness. So um, this one may be a little more difficult, but Dr. King talks about how a lot of the times we create um, perfect leaders when we're talking about the civil rights. So, you know, um, like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. could do no wrong. Um, and that can be intimidating for students to then feel like they have to be 
um, perfect to make any kind of change. But of course, we know that these leaders are human. They did have imperfections. A lot of times, um, the civil rights movement has some problems with feminism and sexism, and Black women aren't highly represented in the civil rights movement because of that. And a lot of the work that they did was very essential for the civil rights movement, but they were in the background. They were organizing events, sending emails, writing news, not emails, sending <laughs> newsletters, writing um, newspapers, but they're not in the limelight, not shown. Um, so how can we talk about the historical consciousness, how sexism affected the civil rights movement, how homophobia um, affected the civil rights movement, because we have people like Baynard Rustin who did amazing things for the civil rights movement, but weren't talked about because of being gay or a part of the LGBTQ community. So then how do we talk about historical consciousness in black history and uh, show students that leaders didn't, weren't perfect and you don't have to be perfect to make that change either. So those were his six principles that I think about all the time now. And I think they can change the way that you view and teach black history. So I wanted to share those. And then I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Graham so she can talk about her resources she wanted to share with y'all. Thanks, October. Um, ever since you said housing discrimination, I was thinking about something that I just read on that. So I do think that we should develop something on that because there's a lot of great scholarship in that field. And that's something that I didn't really know that much about uh, and how important it was uh, and how relevant it is to today's disparities. And so it was really eye-opening, but you know, there's no uh, specific standard about that. And so I know that sometimes that makes it difficult to, to work in, especially since it can be such a rabbit hole. Okay, I am just going to take up a few minutes to show you guys a few more uh, resources that I like. Some of these you've seen before, and um, some of them maybe you haven't. So I'm going to share my screen once again. And uh, so we're back at the newsletter and as you may already all know, uh, on page two, we always have an important links box. And um, so one of the links that I just wanna point out just so you uh, don't forget is called Triumphs, Trials and Transformations. Now, this is something that started off as trials and triumphs, and we've been talking about that for years now, um, but it has since grown and expanded. Uh, this is hosted through the MTSU's Walker Library platform, and um, so it's added the transformations on there. And this is something that a previous uh, graduate student worker with TPS created lesson plans for, uh, so when you go look under lesson plans, you'll find a lot of those. So a lot of Library Congress resources uh, and other ones overlap. Uh, but this has different themes. Uh, this is looking at the, the period, um, uh, mostly uh, you know, between the Civil War and the passage of the Civil Rights Act um, for you know, African-American communities in Tennessee. So this is a great way to teach about local and state history while also tying it into national themes. And so it's got these different uh, themes right here. And uh, the themes have scholarly essays uh, that you can assign your students to read. Um, I would say high school level, uh, definitely uh, appropriate for that. And then there's a lot of primary sources that are tagged on for each theme too. Uh, so it's um, a really great place for you to go and just find things that are already found for you on these different time periods and these different focuses. So that is linked from our website, um, I mean, from our newsletter. Another thing is, um, and this is because I was influenced by um, October talking about Black Joy and how we shouldn't just focus on uh, you know, African-Americans being victims, but I wanted to think about those being creators. Um, and uh, so I focus on African-American artists and I uh, wanted, I, I highlighted one of them on page four named Robert Blackburn because the Library of Congress has a really great exhibit on his work. He actually was incredibly influential. And so, um, 
I, you know, this is why I start off by saying he was one of the most important printmakers in American art history, not just African-American art history, but American art history. And I think when it comes to the visual arts, like painting and printmaking, we don't really think about black artists uh, and their contributions. And so um, here is just a major uh, place to find that kind of stuff. Um, so it goes through and he was actually uh, educated in part through uh, this WPA uh, workshop that was sponsored in, in Harlem, uh, this community workshop. So you can teach this as part of like the New Deal program. And you can also teach this as part of the Harlem Renaissance because all these artists, these literary artists and these visual artists and these musical artists were kind of in this, um, you know, creative space together. And uh, it was just amazing the things that they did. And so, uh, you know, some of the people that he was influential on, like Romar Bearden and Jacob Lawrence, they're pretty big names today, although not as big as they deserve. Um, but uh, Robert Blackburn, he's responsible for, you know, carrying on this milieu, this printing workshop for like 50 years. So a uh, very important uh, person uh, to this vibrant uh, culture of African-American artists. And so I think that's a good way to talk about um, black culture and, and black identity from you know, the, the kind of Harlem Renaissance all the way up to like the 1970s and 80s. Um, so uh, another thing that I wanted to bring up is actually not linked in our newsletter at all, but when I was thinking about African-American artists, I had to mention uh, the Black Crafts People Digital Archive. Now this is a new archive that launched recently and it was created by two of our former graduate students at the Center for Historic Preservation. Uh, one of whom is now a professor at Sewanee and one is a professor at uh, UNC Greensboro, um, Dr. Tiffany Moman and Dr. Torin Gatson. And uh, they have done an incredible job uh, starting to archive lots of objects, craft work and art work. And then also a lot of newspaper articles, which I've noticed uh, about like runaway slaves. And uh, so they're, like I said, this is very early in the life of this archive. And so they are going to be building it and adding to it constantly. And so I find that um, they don't really have anything uh, down here for exhibits and maps yet. Um, but a really great place to find their stuff is actually to follow them on Instagram. Because that's what I do and they post fairly often. And so it's just a great way uh, to see these uh, objects of the day and I'm actually teaching material culture at MTSU this semester. So I'm gonna be bringing this in for my students um, to be learning about culture and identity through these objects and artworks and you know, crafts people and how important they were you know, both free and enslaved to just American art. Um, and you know, I was actually scrolling down here earlier today and I saw this really, where to go? They must have added something. Okay, yeah, it's in the middle now. This really striking painting. And I was like, what is the story behind this painting? And so it's by an artist named Titus uh, Kafar. And so I immediately like looked him up on YouTube and I listened to this 13 minute TED talk where he actually paints out in white the p other people on this painting. He copies this painting from, I believe a Flemish master. Uh, so he repaints it himself. And then he uses a special oil with mixed in with the white paint so that it would fade a little bit over time so that you can still see the people there. And his whole point is, how can we use art to amend history and not erase it or cancel it? Because there's a lot of conversation nowadays about how we deal with difficult history and do we ignore it? Do we just tear down monuments? Like how, how can we tell these stories and so he's talking about how art can be uh, play an important role in that conversation. And I, cause I saw, I was like, wow, he sounds amazing. Oh my gosh, he's like my age. I, I guess I'm to the point where people are not 
older than me anymore. Okay. But uh, so I can't, okay, move my thing so I can exit out. So this is not linked from our newsletter, but it is linked within the PowerPoint uh, that we're going to make available to you later that has all these links uh, through the Padlet, I believe. So I am going to turn this um, back over to Kira. Thank you, Stacy. Um, and I just wanted to bring up, uh, you know, Layla had mentioned the um, teaching hard history. Um, so Hassan Jeffries, um, who is the um, scholar behind that work, um, he is also the editor for this book right here, uh, which is uh, Understanding and Teaching the Civil Rights Movement. Um, it's a collection of essays um, that was done, uh, developed out of uh, some workshops, some teacher workshops they did through, I think, the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, and so some of the work that pops up in the podcast series, I know some of the folks that they've been interviewing recently um, are contributors to this book. Um, and this book is actually part of a bigger series that the University of Wisconsin Press does on understanding and teaching history. Uh, and they focus on kind of different topics uh, in time. Um, but the way that the books are organized is by chapters. And I've you know, not read through all, I've got two of them. I've got this one and uh, the one on teaching slavery. And the pieces of them that I've read are really very interesting, some really great um, ideas for strategies and ways to approach things um, that it definitely got me thinking. Um, so I would you know, recommend those if you're looking for some additional readings out there, um, that those are both very, uh, very good resources available. Um, if you guys have ideas for things that you have run across or things that you use in your classroom, of course, we would love to see you um, share those um, in the chat box. Uh, or send us suggestions and we, if they're available online, we'll be happy to share those through the Padlet as well. Um, Cause there again, there are so many great things that are out there. Uh, we wanna make sure that, uh, you know, folks are aware of some of the stuff that people are using with their students. Um, so let me, as we get ready to kind of close out here. Um, so yeah, so again, if you have things that you would like to share with your colleagues, just, uh, you know, drop those in the chat box or uh, you can send me an email after the fact and we'll be happy to kind of add those to the Padlet, especially again, if they are um, kind of open source, uh, you know, websites and things like that. Um, so again, we'll be adding some things that we've mentioned here to the Padlet as well. Uh, and I will send you guys the link when I send you uh, your PD certificates. Um, we are going to be giving away a book today to so one of the folks who are attending uh, live in October is going to be pulling up our giveaway wheel. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the title for the book. It's in my office and I've not seen my office in a couple weeks. Uh, and so, um, but we um, have, I know one of the idea books that the Library of Congress did on the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that we'll be sharing. And then we'll have another title. And again, I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact uh, book that I laid out. I'm pretty sure it was one on the Jim Crow period um, that the Library of Congress put out a few years ago that's kind of geared towards middle school. Um, I think that's the one that I laid out. <laughs> so I'm going to let October bring up our giveaway wheel and we'll see who gets that book today. Yeah, let me get that pulled up. Okay. And I think I have, let me just triple check. <laughs> Everyone's names in there. Yep, so we'll go ahead and spin. All right. So Wesley is going to be our winner. Um, so Wesley, again, if you'll drop your address um, in to the chat box, we'll get that out to you. Uh, and again, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, we do have one last bit of information to share. Uh, of course, in order to get your participation certificate, uh, we do appreciate your feedback. Um, so we'll drop the link for our short survey into the chat box if you can fill that out. If you happen to be watching this uh, recording later on, if you would also fill out the, sh the survey, uh, we do generate uh, participation certificates based on the uh, once we receive those survey forms. So that helps us with our reporting. Um, and again, we want to thank everyone for joining us today um, as we get into doing, uh, you know, some different kind of virtual programmings for 2021. 
Uh, we are hopeful that we will eventually be back in person, maybe before the end of the year. Uh, fingers crossed for the fall. Um, so uh, our next session, though, will be um, here in just a couple weeks, I think March the 9th. Uh, if I'm remembering the date right off. Yes, March the 9th. Uh, we are going to be doing uh, a session as part of the Discover Tennessee History series on the Trail of Tears. Um, and so if that's something you're interested in, we'd be happy to get you registered. Our next uh, topic for the Digging In series is going to be on scientific advancements. Uh, and that is going to be on March the 11th. Uh, so again, if that's something you're interested in, we would love to have you join us for that. Um, you can find all of the information about our upcoming uh, webinars um, on our website, um, and you can just Google Teaching with Primary Sources MTSU in order to find that. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us today. We will stick around here um, after I stop the recording uh, if you have any questions. Um, but again, thank you guys so much for joining us today.